Can you hear me? I'm not deliberately at the left of the podium. <laughs> I, um, I, forgive me, I need the podium today. I'm having a few issues with my balance, and no, that isn't a political reference either. <laughs> Good morning all. Uh, I begin of course by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the land on which we're meeting today, the people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and of course any other elders from other communities who may be here today or listening. I'm going to put these down for now. Just a little easier. I uh, also wish to acknowledge Daniel Green, the uh, MP, Shadow Minister for the Prevention of Family Violence and the Shadow Minister for Women. Colleen Hartland, MP, Member for Western Metropolitan. The Chair of Victorian Women with Disabilities, uh, Maria Gron. Of course, the Executive Officer for Victorian Women with Disabilities, Karen Howe. Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria Board Members. Executive Officer of Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria, uh, Vidge Geddes. Victorian Public Advocate, Colleen Pearce. The Deputy Police Commissioner, Lucinda Nolan. The Disability Services Commissioner, uh, Laurie Harkin. Deputy Secretary, the Department of Human Services, uh, Katie Hare. Representatives of the Legal Services Board, Gandalf Philanthropy and Omnicare. And members of the Voices Against Violence Project Advisory Group, invited guests and anyone else that I could possibly have <laughs> missed in that list. Uh, at the Vic Health MOU launch recently, uh, I, I, was, I shared the fact that I'd learnt a, a great trick recently from a visiting delegation of Zimbabwe, uh, Zimbabwean female politicians. And after I got up and gave the long list of acknowledgements, each of them got up in turn and, turn and said, all protocols observed. So I thoroughly recommend that for future reference. Thank you so much for the opportunity and the invitation to be a part of today's launch. Uh, and also to hear that uh, very interesting and enlightening panel discussion, which of course uh, did better than I think I can uh, in the uh, time available to me in outlining uh, what came out of these seven critical research papers. They do form a fundamental record, an important record on a devastating issue. They draw on the files, records, experiences of advocates, guardians, disability support workers and professionals working in other sectors. They catalogue the experiences of women with disabilities to fill a recognised gap, an overdue uh, vacuum that had to be filled, that information gap. And most importantly, Victorian women with disabilities have put their victimisation on the record. The Partnership of Women with Disabilities Victoria, Domestic Violence Resource Centre Victoria and the Office of the Public Advocate arose from their respective concerns uh, about the issue of violence against women with disabilities and of course the support of Gandalf Philanthropy and the Victorian Legal Services Board helped make this project happen. I congratulate you all on your efforts. Choice and control should underpin the lives of people with disabilities in Australia. However, this is yet to be the commonplace experience for people with disabilities. I know there are many people here today from a range of organisations. Organisations, services, practitioners working in disability support continue to improve their efforts to realise this professional norm, but more importantly, this fundamental human right. However, choice and control is even harder to get, especially when violence and abuse is present as it is in the lives of many women in our community and particularly when women uh, are experiencing this violence with a disability. This is what Vo Vo Voices Against Violence tells us. It has documented, it has repeated the horrific violence that can be perpetrated on, on a person, on someone because she's a woman and also because she has a disability. Voices Against Violence makes a number of important contributions. One of which, um, and I think Delaney said it better than I can, one of which is hearing directly from women with disabilities. This was done through individual interviews conducted with 20 Victorian women and of course from the case uh, work files from the Office of the Public Advocate. The findings of this project about the nature of violence against women with disabilities include, and you've heard some of, these, uh, uh, some of this outlined, that women with disabilities experience high levels of family and sexual violence that women with disabilities experience the same kinds of violence experienced by other women, but also 
disability-related violence, such as perpetrators controlling access to medication, uh, mobility, communication services, and ex indeed the uh, uh, quote from Michelle, a uh, classic example of that with the wheel, uh, chair having its wheel removed. Gender-based and disability-based discrimination intersect and increase the risk of women, uh, violence for women with disabilities. Women with disabilities experience violence from many, many perpetrators, as you've heard, usually male perpetrators. And one interviewee disclosed that she had been sexually assaulted up to 20 times by multiple perpetrators. And women experience a wide range of violence throughout their lives in a variety of settings. And as you've heard, with economic and financial abuse being a particularly common experience identified by the work of the Office of the Public Advocate. For many of you working in the space to prevent violence against women, in the area of guardianship or even justice and legal services, these results may not be surprising. Although I think Magdalena made a really important point that sometimes it's shocking to hear even the things that we know. So these results may not be surprising, but they are shocking, they are chilling, they are horrifying, they are unacceptable. But the good thing about these papers as well is that they propose a series of recommendations designed to do a number of things. Help women with disabilities experience violence and abuse, to ensure that they know and understand the assistance and support at hand, and to remind those supports and services of their obligations and the ways that they can improve the design, the delivery and their coordination. Emphasise the importance of continuing research and improved data collection and analysis. And I see you've got a role for the uh, National Centre for Excellence in there, as well as uh, the Foundation. To value the experiences and contributions of women with disabilities in a policy setting uh, and in terms of development and review. And keep up the case for investment in primary prevention. Yes, these, these findings highlight the important role of primary pre prevention. These reports highlight what might be done to, s to stop this violence from occurring in the first place, otherwise known as primary prevention of violence against women. It's a strong recommendation, and I see that there's an acknowledgement of the role of the Foundation in this as well, because that's what we're about. The Foundation to Prevent Violence Against Women and Their Children, our core business is primary prevention. We are a national, independent organisation established to drive change and ensure that the community rejects violence against women and children. So our focus is indeed stopping the violence before it occurs. And as many of you know, this involves setting the right conditions for respectful and safe relationships between men and women, girls and boys, no matter what the circumstance. It's about tackling those ingrained attitudes, beliefs and distorted values that give rise to men's violence against women. And it's about engaging the institutions that reinforce or allow or uh, do not challenge these attitudes. I think at the heart of it, it's about gender equality. I do a lot of work, Karen, as you say, in the region now as ambassador for women and girls. So I go to uh, a lot of developing nations, particularly in the region. And some of the statistics that I've had to confront about violence against women and children, family violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, are pretty horrific. But you know what? They still get surprised when I tell them the statistics in Australia. They can't believe that a so-called developed nation like ours has statistics that see 89 women killed between 2008 and 2010, nearly one woman killed by intimate partner violence a week, that one in three Australian women over the age of 15 have experienced some form of physical assault, that one in five have experienced some form of sexual assault. But we also know one thing, and that is that women with disabilities are at particular risk, and that is why it is a priority area of the Foundation. And thank you for acknowledging that that is a priority area for us in the Voices Against Violence paper. It's a good reminder for us, too, to make sure this is front and centre. We also know that these women may be physically more vulnerable to violence. Women have told us how their feelings of self-worth may already be reduced by their disability and that perpetrators may use the disability to increase vulnerable feelings in women who are encouraged to feel sometimes that they've brought this anger on themselves. They may feel even more than other women that they cannot leave because they may not be able to support themselves and their children. It is a terrible, painful situation. All professionals and settings which work with women with disabilities must be conscious of this so-called uh, double jeopardy often faced by women with a disability or women who have children 
with a disability. We know too that some outside the situation may, may sympathise less with the victim because they think that the perpetrator or the carer has a lot to, in, when it is the carer, has a lot to put up with. Living with a deaf, blind or person with another disability, that the perpetrator's life is in some way diminished by the burden. And I put in those comments, ladies and gentlemen, at the request of my mother, who some of you know is deaf. These views and attitudes minimise, excuse or diminish violence against women. When we read the stories that have been captured in this research, it is hard to imagine that this excuse can be, that it dare be excused in any way. But the fact is, it's happening, and these reports show the extent of the challenge before us. Many of you are committed to this challenge, I know that. Primary prevention in this state, in Victoria, has been supported through a number of projects and activities in addition to the Foundation. As many of you know, in the area of disability, Women with Disabilities Victoria has initiated a workforce development project targeting the disability support sector. And this project works on the interlocking discriminations of gender and disability in order to determine the right kind of culture to mitigate the occurrence and impact of violence and abuse on women with disabilities. In this program, different sectors are working together with women with disabilities to drive cultural change. And this is the kind of prevention work that we want to see more of. We watch with interest uh, the outcomes of the evaluation of this project. That always sounds a bit bureaucratic, we watch with interest the outcome of evaluation. What I mean is I can't wait to see the results. And I hope that it works and I hope that it you know, sets a standard and gives us uh, other tools with which we can work. I'm also aware of other prevention uh, projects currently working with women with disabilities in Melbourne. I know there's the one in Melbourne's West and the Year 9 students uh, in, uh, with disabilities in Geelong. Specialist programs that target prevention approaches for women with disabilities and for the disability sector are of course needed if we're to make a positive difference in the lives of women with disabilities. I also note, and you'd be aware, that some great ideas have emerged from Stop the Violence Project, a national initiative involving many women with disabilities across Australia. And the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Liz Broderick, is the sponsor of this project. She's in touch with the Foundation. So we also uh, are very keen to see what primary prevention opportunities will be highlighted by this work as well. So ladies and gentlemen, stopping violence against women and children in this country is our goal. And stopping violence against women with disabilities is fundamental, it's essential to realising this goal. Increasingly, we know what needs to be done to change the systems, services and the circumstances which allow this violence to occur. The suite of papers gives us another voice on the issue of violence against women with disabilities. It gives us more information and an impetus to change the situation. We know that women with disabilities have the right to live safe and productive lives as equal citizens, free from violence and abuse. Uh, and I hope uh, I, and I look forward to working with you all in the achievement of that goal. Ladies and gentlemen, it now gives me great pleasure to formally launch these papers and I'd be doing it a disservice if I only had the summary in my hand. <laughs> so I'm quite obedient, Karen. <laughs> I said to have them all. Ladies and gentlemen, I now declare the uh, Voices uh, Against Violence uh, research papers launched. Thank you.